and uh, pitter patter, we'll get at her. I don't have my notes, which is not good, but all right, you guys see uh, weather control, ILM 310-401F, good to go? Right yeah, on. Good. Thank you. All right, so I'll start off with uh, introduction of boiler control, defining some of the terms uh, related to boiler uh, boilers in particular, and, and of course, in boiler process control. Okay, so here we got a great big picture overall view of a, uh, of, um, boiler system that's pretty much got all the bells and whistles. So what is a boiler? A boiler is a closed vessel that heats water, generates steam, superheats steam, or any of those combinations. And by adding and removing components, uh, you can do any of these various functions that are in there. Um, but as you can see, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of different terms just on this slide here. So wind box, uh, superheater, steam steam drums a big one risers downcomers mud drum economizer air preheater induced draft fan forced draft fan we got feed water valves uh flu stacks all kinds of one good wonderful good things a temperator so lots of different pieces of hardware that are uh, can be uh, involved in your in your boiler system depending on its configuration so defining each of these uh components uh, part of the program here, so nice little handy dandy uh, chart that tells you all the different components in the boiler. Uh, big ones, of course, uh, that we deal with. Uh, steam drum is uh, is a pretty big one. This is a large amount of cylinder at the top of the boiler that provides the space for the separation of the steam and storage for boiler water. So ultimately, it's really the big player because there's there's water in part of it and then steam coming off the the rest of it. Um, yeah, I mean, all of these things are, are things that you need to know. Uh, induced draft fan and forced draft fan, uh, good to differentiate right off the bat, the difference between the two of them. So um, induced draft is a fan that draws flue gases from the furnace and drives them up the stack. So it's, it's sucking out of the furnace. And a forced draft fan is a fan that provides custom air, uh, combustion air from the outside into the wind box. So one, the forced draft fan blows air in uh, from the bottom and the induced draft fan sucks air in from the top and you can see here so force draft blowing some air through a preheater, uh, preheater into the wind box where it gets mixed with the fuel and pressurizes and heats up the tubes the risers and the downcomers uh, in the boiler uh, not all furnaces have both some of them are one or the other but lots of the bigger ones will have both and then so the thing to do to understand about the force draft uh, fan is when it's blowing air into the wind box and providing that air for combustion it's also pressurizing uh, the inside of the of the boiler housing itself so all the area inside here is being pressurized because it's like a balloon you're, you're blowing up a balloon uh, induced draft fan is opposite of that right where now we're we're sucking air out of the boiler itself so creating a negative pressure inside uh, of the boiler so you may not see them both working together um, but individually there's problems that can that can happen you know imagine things like over pressuring the boiler by blowing too much air in it although highly unlikely um, much more likely is if you have an induced draft fan in there and you stop providing air into it you could get that uh, pop can effect where you could actually suck the air out of the boiler and collapse it. So there's, an, there's a couple uh, points to be made later in the ILM uh, about issues related to boilers, and it'll, it'll talk a little bit about these fans uh, later on, as well as you know what happens when our tubes are exposed and things of that nature. Okay, so all these components, be, th be sure to read through uh, this little list here so you uh, understand the basic terminology. Uh, for, for boilers. Okay, boiler control. All of these things, of course, relate to our trade and the control of the boiler. So there are a few different ways that boilers are controlled and managed. Um, 
but there are four main control points on the boiler. So uh, PC1, you'll see on here, PC1, which controls the fuel and air firing rate. So you'll see that the, uh, this is a steam header and we take the pressure off the steam header and depending on the demand, we'll have higher pressure or lower pressure in the header. And the signal from that will be sent to the forced air fan, which provides combustion air, also sent to the fuel valve, which will provide fuel. So on a steam demand, of course, it'll increase the signal to both of them to increase our heat output. TC1 uh, controls the temperature by using boiler feed water. So here we have boiler feed water coming into the, uh, into the steam drum and TC1 is way up here, sorry. TC1 is measuring it on the, uh, on the steam header here. So controlling the temperature of it by introducing uh, boiler feed water, which of course is still water and not steam. Uh, so by using it, we can cool uh, the, the temperature of the, of the header. LC1, uh, this is a pretty important one right here. And we've mentioned LC1, um, I think, in third year, we talked about shrink and swell and steam drum level. Uh, pretty important one here. So LC1 controls the drum level to match the steam demand with the water supply. So the whole idea, of course, of a boiler is to take in uh, a certain amount of water and put out an equal amount of equivalent steam. It's all about balancing what's coming in versus what's going out. That's the whole um, theory behind the control system for a boiler. Uh, the fourth component for controlling a boiler is pressure controller number two, which controls the furnace pressure um, via a fan. So here we have a pressure controller uh, or transmitter coming off the side of the boiler itself, going to uh, a damper on the, on the draft fan here, which will, of course, speed up the fan, decrease the pressure in the boiler, slow down the fan, increase the pressure in the boiler. So these are the four main measuring areas that we use for control in a boiler. All right, so getting a little bit deeper now into uh, stepping back a couple steps. Yeah, these boilers have uh, controls on them to do the different things. How do we control a system that has uh, one or more boilers? Uh, start out with one, one boiler. Um, that's pretty simple. You've got all those components that are on there and they, they do their thing. Most places will have uh, two or more boilers depending on, on where you're at. Um, commercial buildings even will likely have two boilers just for uh, redundancy or, or demand uh, increases. And when you do that, you have to have a, a control scheme that can uh, control the two boilers. So there's um, a few different ways that you can control multiple boilers. Uh, you can send a signal that goes equally to both boilers, or you can have one boiler that's the main boiler and another one that comes on when demand increases or different combinations of that. So the first, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? The first strategy that we're gonna look at here involves using something called a plant master. A plant master is the plant steam header pressure controller. So you'll see that the output from any number of boilers will come to a plant steam header where the steam will then be distributed out to all the users. And to control that, we use what's called a plant master. The reason it's called a plant master is because it's measuring the collective uh, steam that has been produced by all the boilers, not any particular boiler, but all the boilers. So thereby we call it the plant, the plant master. And then the plant master will dictate uh, the, the master firing rate. So how much we want these uh, boilers to come on. So it uses, uh, it sets the steam header pressure through firing demand to all the boilers. So plant means all the stuff. In comparison, we have a boiler master. So here again, we have two different boilers. We still have uh, the plant master that's controlling boiler uh, output based on the pressure of the steam header, but we have added something called a boiler master. And you can see a boiler master down here and a boiler master down here, one for each individual boiler. And the boiler master is an auto manual transfer station with biasing, which means that you can turn the boilers off and on as you wish, and you can, um, you can bias them, meaning you can kind of preload them for how much you want them to contribute to the overall uh, plant steam header contribution. So as we as we read through the ILM there, you'll see that uh, 
we can we can preset this boiler to come on at 25 percent and this one to come on at 100 percent if we wanted or or 75 percent if we wanted 100 percent output from the two boilers instead of just running one so the plant boiler master relationship is basically like a foreman worker arrangement is kind of the way i describe it and it's a way to basically split the load through this biasing uh, among many boilers. So I could have one boiler going at 100%, I could have two boilers going at 50%, I could have three boilers going at 33 and a third percent, uh, I could have one at 70, one at 30, any combination, uh, any combination like that. So depending on how you want to run it, it gives you that flexibility. This leads us into a little bit of uh, an area that I had no idea even existed uh, again until I started teaching this course. Uh, I don't remember this from when I was in school at all, um, but we're going to talk a little bit here about a uh, new drawing style, uh, and it's called the Scientific Apparatus Makers Association Diagram. And hey, it's in the ILM, and it's uh, just another way of representing uh, how the control strategy is executed. Um, it's in our ILM, so we have to look at it. So salmon diagrams are functional control diagrams for boilers, specifically in our application anyway. Uh, I don't know what else they cover, but probably some other, some other scientific apparatuses. But uh, for us, this is boilers. Uh, and we use these to, to convey the logic behind boiler control strategies. So it's, it's like a block diagram, but specific to boilers and overseen by this SAMA organization here. So as a part of uh, our learning in this section here, we have to become familiar with some of the um, some of the symbols that are associated with these SAMA, uh, SAMA diagrams here, uh, and I'll show you a whole one here in the next page. But uh, manual signal processing is this little rectangle here. Uh, final controlling with positioner, this little guy here. All the different ones here. Uh, variable signal. These are probably more important ones. A continuously variable signal is a solid line. Uh, on-off signal is a dash line, yada, yada, yada. But this is, uh, you know, an introduction to uh, SAMA. And once you see what one looks like here, you'll, it'll make a little bit more sense. Okay, so again, scientific, scientific Apparatus Makers Association, similar to ISA, but SAMA diagrams show the details of the controller. So here's what we got comparing an ISA diagram to a SAMA diagram. So we have an input coming from flow transmitter still. We have a controller here represented ISA style, sending a signal up to a final control element. So same idea, same idea here, except that we've got all the controller elements from an ISA diagram wrapped up in a whole bunch of little uh, separate diagrams here. So remember, think about what's in a controller, right? We have the set point, we have feedback, we have auto manual, we have a controller output signal. Um, we compare set point to process variable in here, all of those things. Um, so with salmon diagrams, I guess, in some regards help with that because everything here represents, you know, one of those, one of those functions. So, uh, this represents proportional, this represents integral, uh, the Delta indicates a difference. So it's comparing, uh, the measurement, the PV value from our this control variable here, which would be a set point variable uh, getting fed into the controller. So it's comparing uh, those things there, uh, auto transfer switch, et cetera, et cetera. And then ultimately sending a signal out to the control valve. So again, not expecting you to be experts on this. I don't know what the likelihood of seeing this again is. I'm not a boiler guy, but if you were a boiler guy, anyone in the class of boiler guy, has anyone ever seen one of these before? Anybody? Bueller? Bueller? Gonna take silence as a no. So anyway, that's the SAMA, that's the SAMA diagram, some of the SAMA, some of the SAMA symbols, SAMA SAMA symbols. Um, mostly focus on the ones that are relevant to the stuff that we deal with here. So this is a pretty good basic example of uh, of a representation of a simple ISA loop and the expectations are not for you to be able to, you know, necessarily become experts at this. But I know there's a self-test that asks you to kind of draw one of them. So do pay attention to the basic building blocks 
that compare to uh, a common ISA loop. You'll see here that there's a lot of stuff that's that's not included uh, not included in there, but um, nature of the beast. Okay, here's the differentiator uh, again comparing the two signals. This is in yellow. Uh, surprisingly, there's three or four questions on this in the subtest. Okay, so here it is all highlighted up. Some of the other options that you can get in this block here, right? Controllers can also do summing, selecting, uh, all kinds of wonderful good things. Transfer block, variable signal generator. Remember, this is a continuous uh, signal, solvent line, final control element, transfer block. So those are all basics comparable to ISA diagrams. Normally in class, we'd maybe stop here, but not for you guys, I whip you. Okay, objective two here, describe some control strategies used in the boiler process. Right, a multiple boiler system has five main control points, although we've, uh, we've talked about four with a single boiler, we're talking about five here with um, multiple boilers, each with its own control strategy. Five main control points are below, and we will uh, look at them individually here as we move forward and get some feedback from somebody. Okay, firing rate demand control. So as the name would uh, imply, as demand increases or decreases, we adjust the firing rate to suit. Uh, boiler combustion control, um, kind of using the combustion measurements, furnace draft control, measuring draft, boiler feed water control, uh, using temperature and feed water to control the boiler, and steam temperature control. So we'll look at them all individually. Somebody's got their mic on, providing feedback. All right, so first we'll look at firing rate demand control, pages 13 to 16. And firing rate demand is the signal that sets the fuel combustion rate in a boiler. So the main priority self-explanatory uh, for this particular strategy, uh, it is ultimately pressure control. And I think I have a diagram on the next slide so we can look through this here. Uh, this is commonly used on small single system boilers uh, with unspecified demands and are generally controlled with on, off, or high, low, off control systems. So uh, not a complicated strategy by any means. Um, larger boiler systems are controlled with a pressure controller um, using steam pressure feedback control or feed forward control or manual bias masters. So we'll Think we look at that here? No, we don't. So here's a salmon diagram um, using the steam header pressure going into a pressure controller here, represented by our wonderful salmon diagram, which will send out a signal that increases or decreases our firing rate demand, which will provide more heat and thereby uh, providing more pressure or provide less heat, or bringing us uh, less pressure. But in this case, Drop in steam pressure, in this case, will call for more heat, thereby uh, increasing the firing and command, increasing the fire, and making more steam, bringing the pressure back up to set point. So that's steam pressure feedback. Okay, steam pressure feed forward, a little bit different. Remember, we're comparing some of these strategies that we learned earlier and applying them now to a different process. Steam flow in the feed forward here. Now, steam flow provides a feed forward signal. So not only just using steam pressure in the header anymore, but we're also using steam flow as a feed forward signal. So if we get an increase in uh, steam flow, we then can fire before the steam pressure drops, right? The benefit of a feed forward system is to uh, minimize any uh, upsets caused by uh, load disturbances. So to do that, we have to in, in, introduce a couple of other components into our SAMA diagram here. So here we're measuring steam flow. Uh, I'm not sure why they have two steam flow transmitters here, but at any rate, measuring flow, bringing that signal 
uh, into a summing block. In this case, I guess it's adding the two signals together. But the big thing that it does here is it provides a, a, a gain multiplier here in this section B. I should have notes on this somewhere, but I don't see them on my screen. Uh, into this section B, which basically uh, provides a, a gain multiplier as gain gains do. And then in this block here, it'll add the signal generated by the steam pressure, the signal generated by the steam flow, it'll add them together in the summing block, and then provide that to the firing rate demand. So the gain block is a multiplier that provides a boosted signal to be added with the PI signal from the pressure transmitter in the summer, not the season, uh, the summer, the summer as in the summing block. So I maybe should change the wording in that in the summing block. And last, steam pressure, manual boiler masters. So now here we see we've added these boiler masters. We're not just measuring the, the plant pressure and the plant steam flow here. We are, we are taking the data that we're getting from plant measurements, and then we're adding some signaling provided to us by our boiler master. And anytime we talk about boiler master, think about we're tweaking that specific boiler in some way. So uh, it will provide that, that bias, right? That's what we're doing. We're saying whatever this signal is coming out of this for the demand, I want this one to be less and this one to be more, or I want them to split, or however you feel like running it, this is what the boiler master allows us to do. So to correct, uh, so these allow an operator to lean on a particular boiler using that biasing feature in order to correct the output. They can set the output of one boiler, uh, the more efficient boiler to be higher than the other boiler, which may be less efficient. Uh, or if you want to have, uh, you know, you want this one on week one, this one on week two, all kinds of different combinations that you can set up. Okay, moving from uh, boiler pressure control to boiler combustion control. Uh, for optimum, optimum efficiency and safety, remember we're talking combustion here, so combustion and combustion efficiency go hand in hand. Uh, also combustion safety, the combustion control strategy needs to maintain a precise air to fuel ratio. So we'll talk about three combustion control strategies. Uh, the first is single point positioning control, the simplest form of combustion control. Then we'll look at parallel positioning control, which is basically this with uh, a couple different uh, machines. And then we look at parallel metered control. Um, I'm wondering if I should take a second now and look at a video. Let's just scoot here for a second while we're talking about uh oh snap daniel what did you do i messed up i messed up where's my screen snap i'm sharing the screen i lost my screen it's okay i notice you have 42 pages and you just run a few pages and they're on out because it's crashed Hang on, we'll get her back. What's going on? Oh, my computer's not even wanting to play. All right, let's move this over here. Can you see the slideshow again? Hey, so we're on the summary already. I just wanted to. So yes. I want to zip along to this. I just wanted to zip along with this video because we were talking about we're talking about all these measure methods of, of controlling a boiler, of course. Uh, the reason that it's very important, and this is kind of a segue from uh, the dangers of combustion and, and boiler pressure. I thought I would I want to show this here before we go on a little bit here. So let's let's see what the odds are that this link is gonna work. Oh, excellent. Can you guys see, now, with the you guys see a video? Boilers, after that dead explosion in uh, St. Louis, yeah, now we can, yeah. At ABC's Lindsay Janice is at the PFT and D Training Center in Edison, New Jersey. Good morning, Lindsay. Good 
morning, Michael. In St. Louis, that industrial boiler exploded with deadly consequences. But a reminder this morning, more than 10 million homes across America have boilers and more than 100 million have water heaters. Both can explode if the pressure inside feels too high. This is the moment a piece of equipment found in many homes and buildings explodes. Watch again as part of an industrial boiler inside a St. Louis plant launches like a rocket into the air. It was a little chaotic, uh, people didn't know where to go or what to do. This morning, three are dead and several others are seriously injured after part of the heating system the size of a van and weighing more than a ton flew roughly 500 feet before crashing through the roof of another building nearby. Other pieces of debris several feet long damaging additional buildings in the area. This pipe even flying across the street like a javelin into this man's truck. We heard something blow up out the door and we see dust flying. Dust flying everywhere, This isn't the first time a boiler accident has been caught on tape. In 2015, one exploded in a home in Washington State, spraying nails and hot steam across a children's playroom. It's just like a pressure cooker. It's not very common. But with a lack of maintenance and uh, uh, proper repairs, it can happen. Experts say explosions like this could happen if there's too much pressure built up inside the tank in both boilers and water heaters. Something seen on the Discovery Channel show, Mythbusters. As for the blast in St. Louis, investigators are now looking into the cause. We're going to be looking at all the records to see that, and make sure that everything was up to date. Experts say this is a warning for us all. Whatever you use to heat your home, whether it's a furnace, a boiler, even water heaters, they should be looked at and inspected by a professional once a year. If you do have an older home and a boiler like this one, there are a couple of things you can do once a month to look at it, make sure it's working properly. This is the water gauge. You want to make sure that's about halfway up. If it's too high or too low, call somebody out. And so we just come around the side here. This is what is known as the blow-off pipe, where the boiler releases pressure. You want to make sure that area near the bottom is unobstructed, and if you see it leaking water, call somebody right away. Michael? And um, Liz, is there anything else that we can do to make sure our families are safe? Yeah, experts say that both furnaces and boilers can leak carbon monoxide if they are not properly maintained, so you want to make sure you have carbon monoxide detectors in your home. Michael? All right, thank you, Lindsay. Great advice. So, pretty powerful devices when uh, things go south, right? And that was pretty intense. I don't think the boiler at home generates steam, though. The pressure no, inside should not be that extremely high. No, but it's still under it's still under pressure. They showed well. They showed myth, myth busters there with their hot water tank, and it, it's it all depends on whether your whether your relief valve sticks or not, right? Even even water that's not heated to boiling will will still create some pressure inside the tank that will build up. All right, uh, where do we leave off here? Boiler combustion control. All right, so again, uh, optimum efficiency and safety when we're talking about boiler combustion, we want to talk about air fuel ratio. So when we're talking about uh, combustion control, what controls the air and what controls the fuel? Ask yourself this question. Anyone want to say what controls the air on the boiler that we've seen today? Feed right, forward. The forced, the forced air fan. Okay, so the forced air fan controls how much air goes into our boiler. The induced fan controls how much air comes out of our boiler. And the fuel is controlled, obviously, by the fuel valve. So when we're talking about combustion control, we're probably going to be looking at that. So let's look at these ones again. Single point, simple, parallel, a little bit more complicated, and parallel metered, uh, the granddaddy. Okay, so single point positioning control, also referred to as jack shaft control. The fuel and air flows are not measured actually, and it uses a mechanical linkage and requires a different flow characteristics of the fuel valve and the air dampener to be linearized. So long story short here, the 
fuel and air are mechanically linked. I don't know how many of you have uh, seen a system like this, but I have. Uh, I have actually worked on a system just like this. Uh, this is a air air actuated, basically air actuated damper controller that receives a, a signal from um, a pneumatic signal typically and pneumatically moves the jack shaft. This is the jack shaft here. And you can see all of these things are linked together. So as the, the boiler calls for a, a demand uh, increase, the jack shaft will turn. It'll increase the amount that the fan blows. It'll also increase the amount that the fuel valve opens at the same time. Um, this here requires the different flow characteristics of fuel valve and air dampener to be linearized. Basically means that you have to adjust the, the linkages here so that you get the correct amount of air for the amount of fuel as these things work in, in unison. But single point positioning control, very basic, mechanically linked. Okay, parallel positioning control, parallel positioning control here, uh, throwing that you one of these wonderful uh, SAMA diagrams here, but parallel, really the only thing that changes from single positioning is the word parallel and what that obviously means to us. Uh, so looking at the fuel valve here, the air valve here, instead of having uh, one signal going to uh, an actuator that runs a jack shaft, we now have a parallel a parallel signal here, right? So fuel and airflow are not measured still. Fuel and airflow still need to be linearized with characterizers. Um, and the position transmitters can be mounted on the valve and the dampener to alarm if the position does not match the control signal. So it's a primitive feedback form, um, but we're sending now two signals to the different, uh, different uh, final control elements. Parallel meter control, uh, bringing in actual measurements, right? So previous ones, no real measurements. They were pretty bush. Um, for us as control technicians in most places that we're going to work, this is a scenario that you're going to run into. Uh, anything uh, commercial level or above uh, will likely have measurements on them. So fuel and air flows are measured, as you see here, fuel flow, air flow. Um, we got uh, steam pressure, does not have any active safety constraints to ensure unsafe fuel air mixtures or minimal airflow requirements are maintained at all times. So we do measure the fuel flow, we do measure the airflow, but there's nothing that's keeping that air fuel mixture exactly right. Um, this is gonna lead us into uh, some review of combustion that we talked about last year. Uh, remember when we're when we're when we have a, a burner, a boiler, a furnace, or anything like that, and we change the demand on it, we increase the load on it, or we decrease the load on it. Certain things have to happen uh, in order to main, maintain our combustion efficiency and the amount of excess air. Uh, remember, we always try to have excess air under all circumstances in order to a maintain efficiency, but also be the you know. Uh, keep us from burping out black flames and uh, black smoke and things like that into the environment. So this system, although it does measure the fuel flow uh, and the airflow and has some provision in it to provide trim for them, it, it doesn't have any real way uh, for them to know what's going on in between them. And we'll talk about uh, obviously what happens in order to uh, uh, overcome this this problem because basically what happens now if we have a, a decrease in demand we're not sure what's gonna shut faster right so if it happens to be the air shuts faster well then we're gonna have a whole bunch of black smoke coming up the stack if it happens to be that the fuel flow uh, shuts faster well then we're gonna have excess air one of them is obviously better than the other, um, but there is a control system that will allow us to ensure that, which is, I believe, talked about next. So parallel metered cross limited control. So this is the this is the scheme I was talking about in the previous slide, and it introduces a concept called cross limiting. We talked about cross limiting last year. 
uh, when we were talking about combustion control in analyzers, I believe it was. Um, Cross limiting is an active safety constraint that ensures an air rich mixture is always maintained. And the way that it's done is by taking the signal from each of the measured variables here, the fuel flow and the airflow, and providing that signal availability to the other controller in the situation that it requires. So on a on an increase, we'll use one of the selectors. On a decrease, we'll use the other selectors. And the idea here is that we introduce these selectors so that we make sure we always have excess air. Bringing us to the note at the bottom of the slide here. So the airflow leads the fuel flow on increasing demand, meaning if we have uh, a drop in steam pressure, which is going to cause an increase in firing demand, we want to make sure that we don't pour the gas into the boiler before we put in the air. Otherwise, we're going to be burning way too much gas. We're going to be rich and it's going to be black. So in order to maintain proper uh, efficiency on increasing demand, we increase the airflow first, right? Airflow leads the fuel flow on increasing demand. Hopefully that makes sense. On a decreasing demand, airflow will lag the fuel flow. So meaning if we have a, a, a demand decrease, our firing rate decreases, meaning we're gonna, we're gonna pull, off the, pull off the throttle, we're gonna let off the gas first, which is gonna cause a lean mixture. A lean mixture is okay, there's no black smoke associated with the lean mixture, and then the airflow is gonna follow. So that's how this system is designed to work. The airflow leads the fuel on an increase in demand, and lags the fuel on a decrease in demand. And that's ultimately the, the way we want it, the safest way we want it, the most environmentally friendly way to have that. So Mac Daddy uh, that we talk about in combustion control anyway is the parallel meter cross limited control. Um, read through the ILM there, it'll tell you exactly which, which one of these is doing which one at which time, but that's uh, the that's general idea uh, on an increase one of the selector blocks is uh, in play on a, on a decrease the other selector box is in play all right boiler efficiency here uh, just quick 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 review here remember from last year boiler efficiency at full load we strive for two percent excess oxygen or five percent excess air and in this case we're calling a, a seal measurement 150 ppm who remembers what it was in third year or, yeah, third year. What, what was this number in third year? Because it wasn't the same. Come on, there's at least seven of you out there. One of you have got to remember what that is. No, it was 200 anyway when we when we did this in third year, um, 200. Um, but we're saying that was more towards furnaces, I guess. I don't know why why they differentiate here, but. 2% two two oxygen, 5% air, and 150, 200 ppms of carbon monoxide. That tells us we're running happily. All right, so to achieve the best boiler efficiency, uh, we trim the air fuel ratio. So we make sure uh, we get the air fuel ratio as close as we can. And to do that, we trim it. And by adding a trim controller, uh, we can then characterize the set point based on the firing demand. And this is a great big complicated marvelous drawing here, um, but we're not interested in seeing really too much new here. Here we've got our cross limited uh, firing rate combustion control scheme over here. And what are we adding? We're just simply adding a combustion analyzer here, an oxygen transmitter in this case. And it's gonna read the oxygen in the flu stack and if it's not happy, it's going to provide it's going to provide a value that gets added into the air fuel ratio calculation here in order to bring us back into line. All right, now we are going to look at uh, draft control. So draft control uh, dealing with the way that the air moves through the boiler. So furnace or boiler draft control depends on the type of draft used. And we will look at 
uh, a floor of different ways that it can be done. And again, starting out with Mother Nature and ending up with the Cadillac version of draft control. So natural draft, as the name would apply, relies uh, just on nature, we call it the chimney effect. Uh, just use dampers to control the flow of air going through the furnace. So if you have a smoker at home, um, you're controlling how much heat is in your smoker by opening and closing the dampers. Same thing as natural draft. Next, we have induced draft. Uh, again, induced draft, just like an induced fan, will draw the gases through the furnace with that fan and operate slightly below atmospheric pressure or at a negative pressure. Then we have forced draft using the forced draft fan, which produces the combustion, or sorry, pushes the combustion air through the system. And this operates slightly above atmospheric pressure or at a slight positive pressure. And then last but not least, balanced draft, which uses both of the fans to operate at a slightly below atmospheric pressure. And remember, we always want a boiler to be uh, drawing in, uh, drawing in extra stuff rather than blowing stuff out any gaps or holes or windows or whatever. That's why we want to have it at slightly negative pressure. Um, if you've walked around on some industrial furnaces, uh, you know, some of the bigger ones, two, three stories high, they often have uh, porthole windows on them where you can look in where you can look inside to you know see what the flame looks like, et cetera, et cetera. Um, obviously, in a situation like that, you don't want to have flames being forced out of the boiler, uh, you know, burning people as they walk by, blowing doors off, et cetera, et cetera. So this is why we run on negative pressure on most boiler systems. Okay, so looking at the uh, diagrams, did I skip them all? Yeah, I did. So um, I skipped most of the diagrams here. Uh, basically what happens, uh, of course, force draft will not have this fan. Induced draft will not have this fan. Natural will have no fans. And balanced draft, as we see here, will have both fans. So air pushing in, air being drawn through uh, at the same time. So I, a fair question would be to show you a diagram like this and say, okay, what type of draft is this? Is this balanced because it's got both fans? Uh, is it induced because it only has this one? Is it forced because it only has this one? Uh, is it natural because there are no fans uh, at all? All right, feed water control. I believe this is the third, uh, third measuring element that we use. Uh, as a control strategy here is boiler feed water control. And this relates uh, to the loading of the boiler again, as it usually does here. So the size, pressure, and loading of a boiler will determine the needs for the implementation of the following strategies. And I guess this really kind of would have applied to any of the previous ones also. Um, but we're going to talk about boiler feed water control here. Uh, and we're going to talk about things like drum level pressure compensation. And we've talked about drum level uh, and the effects of drum level pressure and why we need compensation uh, in third year. Uh, the terms that we talked about then were shrink and swell. Uh, that was in measurement, if I'm not mistaken. So hopefully that'll trigger a flashback for you when we talk about that. Then we will talk about single element boiler feed water control, double element or two element boiler feed water control, and then finally three element boiler feed water control. And as, as we did previously here, we move from uh, more primitive, uh, less measurements to uh, more advanced, more measurements used in the strategy. Okay, maintaining a constant boiler steam drum level is critical for both plant protection and equipment safety. So the steam drum, uh, aside from the burner assembly, of course, uh, is probably the second most significant component in a boiler. So a lot of attention needs to be paid to the steam drum. Okay, so here's our flashback to drum level pressure compensation. Um, and we, I think the next slide, just let me flip here. Oh, I thought, 
Okay, we do talk about it here a little bit. Uh, why do we need pressure compensation? Again, the, the density of steam and water at their saturation temperature will change with pressure. Uh, this will tie into more things that we don't really discuss, um, such as the temperature, um, the temperature of steam at a given pressure, and that leads us into things talking about wet steam and dry steam, superheated steam, uh, and things like that. But we don't really cover that in this course. Um, but the changing pressure, of course, is going to change uh, the density, uh, and that's going to change a whole bunch of uh, physical characteristics of water and of steam, how much heat they can hold, uh, all that kind of stuff. Um, the long story short, I guess, associated with the slide that we're looking at here is the, the different set points that we'll have for our level transmitter based on the, the pressure in the steam drum, uh, which affects our density. So remember, we have our PGH formula, which uses um, pressure, gravity, and density. So if we have changing pressure, that means that we're going to have also changing density. And then when we do our PGH calculations, it's going to vary. So uh, looking at the chart here, we have a, a drum pressure of 2,000 kPa, and we have a drum pressure of uh, 1,000 kPa. Same drum, same physical dimensions, all that kind of stuff. But at 2,000 kPa, you'll see our lower range value is this value. Our upper range value is this value. Um, at a lower chain, a lower pressure in that same drum, we have different calibration settings. So what does this mean to us? Well, if we're not operating at the designed pressure, our calibration values are going to be off, thereby our level indication is going to be off, thereby we could be raising or lowering the drum level inside here, uh, which is exposing uh, tube, it's, it causes all kinds of problems. So we have to be aware of the effect of pressure anyway. Okay, so in order to correct for any fluctuations in pressure, of course, we have a dumb, uh, drum pressure transmitter, which allows us uh, to uh, correct for it here. So we have a drum level transmitter, basic control, and then we add in drum pressure, and that gives us a, a multiplying block here. We'll take two signals then and provide that to our final control, uh, final controller and final control element. If we have multiple drums, multiple drum level transmitters, they all get included here, uh, combined into a median. I think this is a median controller here that will pick uh, either the middle or the, the average of these three. I think it's the middle of these three signals and multiply that with our pressure transmitter signal to provide an output in order to compensate for changes in drum pressure. Okay, here's, uh, here's the flashback slide, shrink and swell. And these are the terms that are used to describe what happens as the drum pressure changes. And what they ultimately are, uh, are uh, causes for temporary false level signals. So pressure decrease, uh, keep in mind here, we're starting out with uh, a level consistent. Okay, let's say that we start out here, uh, both drums are at 1500 kPa. And this would be our level. So if I drew it across here, the level would be higher in this one, lower in this one, they would be even. So get that in your mind first, picturing them both even at 1500 kPa. Then in this drum, we reduce the pressure down to 1000 kPa. What does that do when we reduce the pressure? It allows the molecules to stretch out a little bit, allows air bubbles to form a little bit, which means that the volume inside the drum actually increases. The density of the uh, liquid decreases because there's now bubbles in it. So that means that the volume increases. One second, Michael. And that causes uh, a false increase in level that would be sensed by our level transmitter. Go ahead, Michael. If we have multiple drums, will those pressure will still be the same? If the drums are connected to the same header, they should all be the same. Um, but again, uh, different drums will have different uh, different feed water valves. They'll have different discharge valves. So can't guarantee that they're going to be the same because each individual uh, drum will have its own in and outlet control going to the header. So they could they could be different. Uh, they could be the same. Thanks.
Okay, and then so conversely, if we increase the pressure in the drum, of course, we're forcing the molecules together, we're squishing the bubbles, uh, we're making the, the liquid more dense, and as such, it's going to shrink in volume, and the level is going to drop, and that's going to be sensed by our drum level transmitter, uh, and it's going to drop our level, uh, which is in turn going to cause the system to think that there's an increase in demand because our level has gone down, right? The, the steam drum, uh, the drum level is often used to control the amount of steam. So if the drum level goes down, then it's gonna cause uh, an increase in the firing rate, which is gonna you know, create more heat, which is gonna create more pressure, which is gonna, and it's, it's something that, again, we have to worry about these temporary false signals. So that's why pressure control is important. Okay, so looking at single element drum level control, uh, very simple drum level transmitter is the single element that we use to control the feed water valve. So the level within the drum sent to the level controller and the level controller will open and close the feed water valve in order to maintain our, our level. Uh, again, here is a sample diagram representing the, the similar process here. Uh, process here. Uh, what is the downside, of course, to a single element drum level? Well, it does not compensate for shrink or swell effects because it has no pressure compensation at all. Uh, this application would be for small boilers with slow load changes or large base loaded boilers, meaning if you had a multiple boiler system with a, a big boiler and a couple of smaller boilers and the big boiler runs most of the time and when there's an increase in demand, uh, you know, supper time, cold days, shower time, whatever it is, uh, then the other boilers would come in. Uh, they would have their own control scheme. So the significance of the on the big boiler would be not as much. So relatively primitive control scheme. Uh, let that one go. What the heck do I got going on here? Wow. Looks like I... Looks like I skipped a few things here. Uh, yeah, I don't even know what to tell you guys. Have I missed, does it, does the ILM show uh, double and three element schemes in there? I have to check now. I'm unlikely to skip a whole bunch of things. Yeah, we have double and triple. All right, so. I don't imagine that it's very complicated, and that's probably why I did not talk about them individually. Um, so yeah, just quickly here, two element introduces a, a flow transmitter on a steam header. So that would be the second element. And then the three element uh, introduces a, another flow transmitter on the boiler feed water line, uh, which introduces another measurement. So uh, one of them is a feed forward, and one of them is a, uh, almost looks like a cascade type of signal. So adding the elements, of course, increases our control and increases our uh, stability uh, in the system. And I guess I'm just going to have to leave it at that. I'm not sure why I left that all out. Anyway, as we work your way through the single uh, single two and three element drum level control, you'll see that the double will uh, alleviate shrink and swell, but it'll still have a problem. And then the triple uh, or the three element will uh, eliminate one of the issues that the double uh, did not uh, take care of. So ultimately what you end up here is a very primitive, uh, very primitive uh, process loop, then you had a flow transmitter that provides some feedback uh, from the steam header, and then you provide another flow transmitter, which is going to provide you uh, information on the feed water supply, which is a feed forward signal that gets added into the controller. All of these things, uh, of course, making the system uh, more complicated, but also more robust. All right, steam temperature control. So I believe this is the fourth element, if I'm not mistaken, might be the fifth element, I lost count. Um, but steam temperature control and how do we use 
that measurement in the process here. So steam leaving the drum is wet. Okay, we, we get water in the drum, we heat it up, it turns into vapor, and we call it steam, and we put it into a steam header. And this kind of steam is what we call wet steam. It's the same kind of steam that you experience when you're boiling a pot of water and the water turns into vapor. Uh, the only difference is the, the, the difference between atmospheric pressure and the pressure that we've contained it in. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Wet steam is used for uh, heating applications, you know, building heating applications, uh, cooking, um, not like making steamed rice, of course, but uh, using it in pipes to, to heat pots uh, in that type of cooking, uh, drying applications, uh, same way we're not drying it by spraying it with wet steam, we're drying it by uh, putting a, a heated tubes, tubes that are heated with wet steam in front of a fan and then creating hot air of course. <coughs> All right. Um, what does that say here? So steam leaving the drum is wet. We use that for heating, cooking, drying, etc., and is controlled by pressure transmitter in the, in the steam header. Uh, I'm not sure why I threw that in there, but I did. Uh, turbines, and then we don't really talk about it very much, but turbines, which are major industrial machine, machinery that's very popular here in Alberta, uh, they need dry steam, and you've probably heard of uh, wet and dry steam. The difference is saturated or wet steam is superheated by hot combustion gases in order to make dry steam. This dry steam is controlled by a temperature transmitter. So when we have talk about dry steam, we're talking about superheated steam, which we don't really get into, but I'll just quickly tell you the difference. Saturated steam is wet. And moist and has water in it, uh, it condenses relatively easily because it's not at a, a pressure that uh, allows it to stay saturated. Superheated steam uh, is heated hotter and at a different pressure that allows it to uh, allows it to not condense as easily, and that way we can use that steam, which contains a lot of uh, energy in order to spin turbines, which is very common uh, here in Alberta in cogens and things like that. Okay, superheated steam temperature is controlled by the attemperator. And if you remember way back in slide two, we talked about the pieces of equipment and the attemperator, attemperator was the first piece of equipment off the top of the, uh, of the steam drum. And the attemperator basically is like a post heater or a, a pre, uh, I can thought of post heater or post uh, cooler, I guess. It's cooler, I guess, that they use to control the temperature of this of the superheated steam. So it's 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 like a it's like a radiator, I guess, is a, is a easy way to put it. Uh, so the attemperator or the desuperheater uh, basically sprays boiler feed water into the steam, uh, and that's how it controls the temperature of the superheated steam. And you might say, okay, well, how come we're spraying, we're spraying boiler feed water into superheated steam? Isn't there going to be water in there? But the answer is no, because it's at such a high temperature that that water automatically forms into a vapor. But as it forms into a vapor, it draws heat out of the dry steam, and that's how it works. Don't worry about any more than that. That's above our pay grade. Okay, that takes us to out of strategies. Uh, pressure control and temperature control and level control and the other uh, the other pressure control um, to problems. So describe problems associated with boiler process control. And as we saw earlier, uh, problems can be very 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 bad, or they can be you know efficiency issues. So let's look at what we have to say about that. Okay, drum level. Very important. Drum level is again, I said, aside from the boiler structure itself, the drum, the drum is probably the second most critical piece of equipment. And of measurements, drum level is probably one of the more critical ones. Uh, too low of a drum level, and the tubes are going to be damaged. Too high of a drum level, and there's going to be water carryover. So what this means when the drum level is too low, 
meaning that the drum doesn't have water in it and the tubes that are inside of the boiler become uh, exposed to hot flames with nothing in them. You're basically cooking the tubes. You're not transferring any heat into water. You're not generating any steam. And ultimately, you're just making red hot tubes inside the boiler. And that, of course, is going to have a carryover into changing the properties of the metal and all kinds of wonderful stuff that we don't get into. Um, too high of a drum level, and you're going to get water carryover. And water carryover is simply water in our steam header. And water in our steam header is not good because it can damage downstream users like turbines and superheaters. Okay, uh, how do we get over drum level safety? What do we use for drum level safety? Most of you have probably done PMs on uh, drum level switches. I know I've done more than my share. Uh, high and low level trips are in place to shut down the boiler if either high level or low level occur. Uh, these are always in conjunction with, of course, level transmitters uh, in more uh, you know, larger scale uh, industrial type systems. Basic systems, uh, basic heating systems, for example, uh, City of Red Deer, for example, at the wastewater plant, we had uh, two boilers, a big one, and we had a little one, and they were just strictly switches, high temperature switches, uh, low temperature switches, high and low water switches, uh, flow switches, they were all, they were all switches, but as you get uh, into bigger systems, uh, they get more technological. Okay, furnace draft safety, uh, looking at uh, some of the issues with proper draft, and we talked about them earlier. Uh, improper draft can cause catastrophic disaster called implosion. Uh, implosion would be due to a reduced pressure in the furnace compared to the atmosphere, and I said that was the, the tin can effect when we have the forced air fan not forcing any air in and the furnace not able to uh, draw through as much air as it's sucking out with the induced fan. So that would uh, essentially cause the uh, boiler to cave in. Big problem, of course. Um, blowing up, not as, not as likely. Um, there's no way that you're gonna get a forced air fan to provide enough pressure to, to blow up a boiler, um, but it takes less pressure to, to suck it in. Okay, uh, another furnace draft safety concern here is if the fuel trips the furnace. Uh, when the fuel trips the furnace, aka you have a problem with your fuel, fuel supply, it's got to shut down in the proper order. Again, always wanting to maintain uh, excess air, so fuel trips then the air will follow, hopefully. Uh, what we're going to say about it here is the ID fan is slowed down and then force draft fan is ramped up. This is to create a positive pressure in the furnace, right? Of avoiding that disaster. When you have a uh, parallel, uh, parallel or balanced draft system where you have both fans in there, you want to make sure that you have pressure inside the furnace. And when you get a furnace trip, that's going to be a demand uh, decrease for everything. So things are going to stop happening. Uh, you want it to happen in the way that you desire. So in this case, you want to slow down the ID fan, which is going to decrease uh, the vacuum inside of it and increase the force draft fan, which is going to increase the pressure inside of it, and that'll eliminate the uh, threat of imploding. And smaller down, looking, zoning in a little bit here, uh, burner management systems. A lot of these burner management systems can be related directly to your home furnace. Uh, your home furnace has burner management uh, as well as a, a industrial commercial boiler or furnace would have uh, industrial commercial sized controls. Same types of controls can be found uh, at home as you will find in industry. Not all of them, of course, but uh, many of them. Okay, causes of explosions include fuel without spark. So obviously, uh, fuel without spark uh, isn't obviously going to make a, a problem initially, but if a spark were to suddenly appear 
uh, long after it was expected to appear, long after the fuel got to the party, that could be a big problem. Uh, fuel leakage in an idle furnace, I don't know of a great example uh, for that, but it seems to be self-explanatory to me. Uh, loss of flame and then a relight. So let's say, for example, you uh, lost your pilot or something like that, or you lost your flame and before the fuel valve, uh, before the system detected loss of flame, your fuel valve stayed on for a little while. And then you go, oh, my, my flame went out. And then you hit the sparker button again. Uh, you got all that gas in there and then kaboom, we've probably all done that on the barbecue. Uh, lack of purging prior to lighting. So very similar to the previous example here, uh, making sure you don't have any combustibles inside the boiler before you hit the, the fire button. And another uh, issue, of course, bad fuel ratio. So uh, too lean, uh, decreasing efficiency, wasting energy, or too rich, um, making black smoke, um, bad efficiency, bad for the environment, et cetera, et cetera. So to get over that, we have burner management systems. And here's a great big old Mac Daddy pen, um, a Mac Daddy diagram showing you a burner, burner management system. Uh, and all the different controls that are in place, all the different interlocks that are in place, all these symbols here with the slash in them, if you uh, don't know, these are interlocks. So they're saying that all of these different things have to be fulfilled before we'll even, uh, before we'll even allow things to, to happen over here. So you got pressure switch interlocks, high and low interlocks, uh, all kinds of different stuff in here. I'm, I'm not going to walk you, uh, I'm not going to walk you through uh the step-by-step -step process here the ilm i believe does that in a couple of pages here but basically uh what we're saying is that there's certain things that certain criteria that have to be uh achieved before we'll allow you to um open the gas valve or turn on the igniter um all these things have to be uh, in place and that's what a burner management system uh does okay so burner management systems uh, set start permissives to ensure safety. Some of these start permissives include purging and reset of boiler trip logic. So if it was previously tripped, there's got to be a method for it to be reset and to purge so that everything is safe. It's just like, uh, you know, just like relighting your furnace. You want to make sure that there's no gas in your ducting before you, before you start it up again. Uh, igniter, uh, igniter gas pressure management. So making sure that you have uh, proper gas on your pilot line so that when you uh, open your pilot valve and you press the igniter that there's gas there. Uh, burner gas pressure management, again, same idea, making sure that there is gas pressure. It's not too high, not too low, so that when you open the gas valve after the pilot has been lit, uh, that the burner will light, right? And there's a, there's a tie-in between the pilot and the main burner as you probably would know in your furnace, right? It's not gonna, it's not gonna fire up the main burner if the pilot's not, the pilot valve usually uh, turns off the gas so that you can't light the main burner. And other gas management logic. Okay, so simple, complex boilers range the full gamut. Uh, some of the things you can relate to uh, home applications uh, they are in many ways relatively simple and then some of the stuff we learned was uh, kind of industrial so boilers can be simple or complex boilers are giant bombs and they must be respected and understood and that is the end of 310-401-H I'm not sure what it is H G G I think H boiler control F, F not even close Excellent.